podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this morning's Crop Talk. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question section on the GoToWebinar menu, and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. A reminder, this is being recorded, and I will share the recording with you, the link with you, at the by the end of the day. Thank you. Thanks, Laurie. I'd like to welcome everybody to Crop Talk for May the 8th. And uh, as we get into seeding, uh, or seeding kind of getting into almost the midway point, uh, I thought it would be a good time to talk about uh, getting some canola in the ground for uh, some of a lot of, a lot of producers that haven't started yet and some producers that have got a bit in the ground. Thought it'd be a little bit of a uh, good time to talk about some of the do's and don'ts and uh, we have uh, Dane Froze on today and he's our oilseed guy in Carmen and he's going to be uh, giving us a talk about uh, tips for planting the, the 2019 canola crop and then uh, after that uh, I'm going to give a bit of a crop update and then uh, talk about the issue of uh, sprayer weight. I've been getting lots of calls from producers uh, you know, I got got to do my burn up, and I'm running out of time, and uh, so I'll go through a few slides and talk a little bit about that. And uh, before I pass it over to Dane, I want uh, everybody to kind of look at the picture on the right hand slide here, uh, kind of the middle picture. If you look way back in the background, there's a tractor, an air seeder, and a tank, and you can see how the, it's snowing that day. So that was last Sunday when uh, a guy right by our place was uh, was seeding. So I kind of found that. Interesting that uh, seeding in the snow. So that's uh, something that's uh, I've had it after after seeding and I've had it before seeding, but never seen it where a guy was seeding in the snow. So with that, uh, I will turn it over to Dane and we'll get started with planting the 2019 canola crop. All right. Uh, thanks so much, Lionel. I appreciate the invite to uh, uh, being uh, on, on board here. Just going to get my screen maximized, and then we will be good to go. Oh. No. I don't know. Uh, can everybody see that screen? I'm not able to maximize it at the moment. It has a issue there. Uh, Dane, do you want to put it in um, into presenter mode um, to slideshow? So on the far on the top, you'll have the word slideshow in your top yeah. toolbar. Top toolbar. Orange. It says slideshow Orange. all the way to the left. On your on your not on your um go to menu on the menu to the PowerPoint presentation. <clears throat> Very top there's a word slideshow. Keep going over to the right. Right. Right oh yeah, sorry. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then from the beginning, there you oh, go. Yeah. Okay. Didn't work with it. Thank you. You're welcome. My apologies. No worries. Doing a shortcut there. All right. Early season canola management. Um, much like other years, I mean, we're not always we're not always given the best conditions to to start with. And just trying to advance slides here. I'm having some computer issues actually. Hmm. Unable to advance slides for some reason. Well, that doesn't seem to work. With your mouse, there we go. We'll just, we'll just, we'll just manually force it through. Okay. Uh, for uh, or tips for canola seeding success. I mean, we're, there's a number of conditions we want to be aware of as we're planting canola uh, by around May 8th. Uh, we'll go through a number of uh, tips to make it more successful, and then we're going to evaluate whether it's the right time of year to seed canola as eagerly as has, has been reported across Manitoba, or if maybe we should take a second look and see what, um, what, what, the, what our best solution would be. Uh, so seeding rate, right off the hop, I mean, canola, for a successful canola stand, we want to target five to seven plants per square foot. That's going to give us our economic uh, yield optimum and yield maximum. Um, higher than that, it's it's a little bit unnecessary and we tend to find that we're putting too much seed in the ground and it just self thins down to about that level and, and those plants are, are, are not reaching their full potential in terms of pods and seeds. They just become thin and spindly and they tend to lodge a little easier. 
too low and we're leaving yield on the table. So once we drop about below four plants per square foot, I mean, we can still have very successful canola yields, but our odds of success are greatly decreased by having a too thin a stand. So cutting back seeding rates um, works to a point, but at, at some point, um, we're just going to be giving up yield and, and, and losing a lot more sleep by having fewer canola plants out in the field, having to worry about them a lot longer. So to calculate the seeding rate, uh, there's a wonderful resource that uh, the Canola Council of Canada has put together. It's online at canolacalculator.ca. Uh, all the above formulas and information can be punched into that, that calculator very easily uh, to determine your seeding rate, your desired population, um, and any number of other factors. And just ran through an example here. So if we're targeting six plants per square foot, and we know our thousand kernel weight is four and a half grams, it says so right on your certified seed tag, take those two numbers, multiply them, and divide by um, the expected seed survival uh, percentage times 10%. So 65% is, is about par for the course for expected seed survival out of an air drill. Um, some farms claim that they can get it higher, which is great. I mean, if, if you're doing everything right and, and the conditions are perfect and you've got your airspeed velocity lower, you've got a nice gentle opener, you can get that number higher. Um, but between 50 and 60% seems to be the norm for much of the prairies. So we're, we're taking our expected seed survival that way, multiplying by 10, taking those numbers, dividing them out, and we get a seeding rate of 4.1 pounds an acre. Um, it's important to remember to adjust for 1,000 kernel weight. Um, five pounds an acre, 10 acres of bag throwing in the tank does work, but we, you do tend to over seed or under seed depending on how um, precise that thousand kernel weight is and if, and if you're changing seed lots remember to take a look at the bag and calibrate your drills accordingly. So rates should be adjusted for the equipment, your field conditions and your seed place fertilizer rates all of which we'll touch on and important thing to note here is expected seed survival is lower than you might think. Um, I do get questions from time to time if my seed lot says I've only got 3.7 or 4 grams uh, per thousand seed weight um, the seed size does have just, or just because the seed size is smaller, doesn't mean that the seed has any less vigor. Um, some studies have been done that that say that it doesn't. It's irrespective of the seed size, uh, they do generally germinate and produce a healthy plant just as well as those from a larger, larger seed. All right, uh, moving forward on to seeding depth and speed. So generally, uh, it's recommended to seed kill between half an inch to one and a quarter inch is deep. One and a quarter can get a little deeper depending on soil texture. If you're seeding into a heavy, uh, canola is a small seeded uh, crop as we all know. The smaller the seed, the less energy that that seed has to uh, put out its root, put out its, its um, the, the shoot and the hypocotyl and, and coleoptile for other crops and punch through that surface. If it gets too far down, it may run out of steam before it reaches the surface and is able to germinate. Um, so if we're able to seed it between half an inch to an inch is, is generally ideal. Um, seed, can, seed bed conditions have been pretty good across most of Manitoba. I mean, it has been drier on the surface in, in large areas of the province, uh, but usually seed bed moisture is just underneath, um, maybe an inch down, maybe a little further in places. It may not be advisable to chase moisture, uh, especially if you're going down to the two inch mark. It's, it, it, you tend to run into more issues that way. It may be better off to seed a, a little lighter into the soil, seed it into the dust, and wait for those rains, those warm rains to come and germinate the crop uniformly. Uh, there's nothing worse than having a non-uniform crop, since that's gonna stay with you the entire season. Uh, from spray timing, herbicide timing, to fungicide timing and having uh, different plants flowering at different times, and then to harvest management and timing that way for swathing or for pre-harvest desiccation and straight cutting. Just trying to get that off to as even a start as possible is a great way to go. Um, this is a study on the bottom, this, this graph on the bottom is a study out of Alberta uh, at Beaver Lodge. It's just the effect of seeding depth on plant emergence. So we're gonna be looking, at these, these, these numbers come in plants per square meter, uh, divide that by 10, we basically get it per square foot. So at a seeding depth of 12 millimeters, we're looking at um, about 120 to 120, 30 uh, plants per square meter, which is 10 to 13 plants per square foot, more or less. And as we drop that down to say 50 millimeters, which is uh, five centimeters 
or two inches, that number drops off uh, fairly significantly. And we, and we go down to uh, five plants per square meter and, and we're, we're down into the bottom end of our uh, ideal plant stand range at five plants per square foot. Next thing up, speed. Um, we all like to get a, our acres seeded as, as quickly as possible. And with advances in machinery and technology, we're seeding more acres faster than we ever have in the past. Um, it really is only May 8th, and we haven't had the, the best ideal germinating conditions uh, for, for much of Manitoba. Many cereal crops are in, and if you're done your cereals considering seeding canola, uh, keep it in mind that we don't need to seed canola as, as quickly as we, as we need to, given that we do have about a month's worth of, of um, timing left. I mean, it's, it's hard to predict what the seed, or weather conditions are going to be, but we, we do have some time there. So it's not as critical to rush through all that canola and do a bad job, slow down, take the time to make sure that, that seed is going in properly, it's going at the right depth, you're getting a good seed to soil contact, you're getting good fertilizer dispersion, and uh, your seed bed conditions are good. Uh, bumpy conditions from uh, roughly tilled soil when it was wet and sticky late last fall, can cause the row openers to jostle and your uneven depth placement becomes a, uh, an important factor. And you want that good seed to soil contact for uh, good uh, seed imbibition. So that first drink of water that canola crop gets is not going to be able to get that if it's in loosely uh, skiffed in soil or, or floated on and harrowed in. If it's placed just on top of moisture, if that moisture is at a, at a good level or, or somewhat packed in and, and has good seed to soil contact, it's going to be able to wick in moisture uh, through the capillary effect from surrounding surrounding soil a lot easier. So getting that um, evenness is important to get that germination off to the same start. And then dropping the fan RPM just to reduce seed damage. Um, if you have the fan velocities too high on the air cart, uh, canola is a sensitive seed. It's got a thin seed coat. Uh, it gets banged around and jostled through meter rolling housing. Uh, the, the, the um, air tubes and then the uh, distribution manifolds on the air seeder. Um, every time it hits the side, it can skiff and damage, it can rub off seed treatment, it can break open seed coats, and then the germination of that seed is then, uh, and survivability is significantly reduced. Also, if the fan's too high, um, you could just risk blowing seed right out of the furrow if you're seeding in a little shallow. Slow it down to the lowest possible point that you're able to move both seed and fertilizer effectively into the row and not lose it out onto the surface. All right, so I talked about delaying seeding. Um, we haven't had the greatest conditions. Uh, well, it does like it a little bit warmer. I mean, we don't need the, the 10 degrees that we, we would like to see three degrees that, that wheat will tolerate a little better. Uh, so by delaying seeding, these numbers come from uh, Manitoba crop insurance data from 05 to 2013. So we're looking at average yield responses based on seeding date. So I picked off the canola line in the, the purple line, it, it kind of curves at the top here. Uh, we're going to achieve above 100% average yield potential by seeding ahead of the halfway through the third week of May. So we're going to get 100% yield potential until about May 25th. After that point, we drop below the 100% average yield potential and it does decline, but it declines at a significantly slower rate than some other crops do. If you compare this to field peas, we want that crop in early because by the second week of May, we're already below the 100% yield potential line and it just drops from there. So canola is a lot more forgiving. Um, we do have the potential to seed it a lot later uh, and most areas have crop insurance coverage that extends a lot longer for canola than other crops. Um, if, if your conditions aren't perfect, it may be advantageous to, to, to wait a little while, seed a little later, get those warmer conditions and um, Leave the leave the flea beetles to feed on the neighbor's crop, as it were. So I talked about uh, seed place fertilizer a little bit. It's still an important uh, conversation to consider. Uh, so know the seedbed utilization efficiency of your seeding implement. So to find that out, it's taking out the or taking the row spread width. So you say you have a hole opener that has a three-inch seed distribution spread, and measure that over the the distance between your rows. So a three inch spread over a nine inch spacing turns out to a 33% seedbed utilization efficiency. 
fertile beds, a fairly high number. Um, a number like that gives us an indication that we could put more fertilizer down safely with the seed than we would be able to in a disc opener, for example, uh, that has a sub one inch um, spread and depending on the, on the row width spacing, usually between seven and a half and 10 inches. Um, the Manitoba uh, Crop Fertility Guide recommends about 20 pounds per acre actual phosphate under ideal conditions. Um, we have had decent conditions. We do have some seedbed moisture, but it's not excessively wet in most areas of the province. Uh, so we're, we're definitely dropping down from that ideal. Uh, just keep in mind what that levels higher than that can cause seed injury and emergence issues. So dry soils, particularly if you're skiffing into dust or, or your seedbed moisture is below two inches, uh, we're, we're going to increase the risk of ammonia toxicity from uh, MAP, monoammonium phosphate, uh, as, as well as um, sulfur, if, if we're putting in seed row sulfur and, and nitrogen, of course, too. Uh, the lack of soil moisture there does, does not dilute and dissipate that fertilizer. Unless we get some adequate rains very, very quickly, we're, we're going to be having a very hot seed row and the canola then will, 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 help, will suffer from the ammonia toxicity and the salt effect of the other fertilizers. Canola seed is not decreasing in price. Um, so as we drop seeding rates, to, to deal with the, the expensive seed cost, we have a lot less room for seedling loss. So it becomes more critical to watch what your seed place fertilizer rates are, uh, what your survivability rates are, and adjust for those accordingly. And just know what, what's an acceptable level of loss to you as a farmer and uh, be, be able to deal with the consequences if, if um, you choose to go with a lower seeding rate and, and high seed bed or high seed placed uh, fertilizer use. So just to highlight that example, seed placed phosphorus. Uh, here, this was taken at Little Palooza in 2016 at Portage. Uh, on the left hand side of the image, we have 20 pounds P205 per acre with disc openers at 12 inch spacing. So, just to do the math really quick, that's a one inch spread over a 12 inch spacing. That is point, um, point 0.8 of a percent seed bed utilization. So, that's a very, very low factor. That's concentrating a lot of fertilizer directly in a very small seed bed. Uh, you can see the very clear effect of what, what that had there for supply at all. We have a very lush looking uh, canola stand. So dropping the phosphorus and the sulfur rates or find an alternative placement strategy. Um, band it on ahead of time, side band it, a mid-row band it, um, put the minimum amount or, or what's considered a safe amount with the seed and then put the rest elsewhere if you do need more. Uh, consider top dressing, that also does work. Um, broadcast or, or heroin corporation in spring also works and uh, removing the sulfur particularly from the seed row given that that has a fairly high ammonium and salt toxicity factor. And for nitrogen concerns uh, very much the same thing. When weather is hot and windy we haven't had the hot but we have had the windy and the cold uh, reduce the rates in table seven this table by approximately 50 percent so cut those numbers in half. If we're looking Looking at a three inch spread on a hole opener um, in, in western Manitoba, the soil texture tends to be a little bit more in the medium range. We're looking between 20 and 30 pounds of nitrogen that can be safely applied with canola seed. These are under ideal conditions. If we don't have that moisture there, drop those numbers in half. So we could be looking at 15 pounds of nitrogen. Um, 15 pounds of nitrogen you might be already getting from the AMS and the MAP that's already going in the seed row. That's it. You can't apply any more urea with the canola. An ESN is not 100% bulletproof in a dry year either. Uh, we aren't as dry as we were last spring. Um, knock on wood, hopefully we get a little more moisture to, to replenish some soil reserves. But uh, this is 60 pounds and is ESN added to the seed row on the left side. The seed bed utilization was low on a sandy soil, so it didn't have that same binding capacity as a clay soil. The safe rate of seed placed urea there was zero. An ESN label indicates that three times it's you can apply three times the safe rate of urea as ESN, but three times zero is still zero. And uh, there is some effect there from seed placed N as ESN. And landscape position. Um, sandy soils from a hilltop, there is, there is a bit of an effect in, in terms of seed survivability versus from a hollow where you have a little bit more of the clays uh, dominating and, and uh, seed place safety is a little bit better. Uh, so it's not so noticeable on monoammonium phosphate, but it's definitely more noticeable on uh, ammonium sulfate, uh, so the, the AMS sulfur that you would be using. 
um, these are soils from the Brandon area. If we're looking at a hilltop that is has that less the lower organic matter, less binding capacity, more more sand in the profile, um, we're certainly seeing a loss in canola with 18 kilograms per hectare. So it's about 18 pounds per acre sulfur versus uh, the same soil in the in the hollow. So to talk about flea beetles a little bit, uh, flea beetles are definitely out already. Uh, striped flea beetles do tend to emerge first. They're a little tougher. They handle some of these windier, cooler conditions a little better, uh, followed by crucifer flea beetles, but we've seen both. Uh, the peak feeding time is, is late May and early June, and we are coming up on that. But given that we had a warm week a week ago, um, that spurred them to emerge from their dormancy stage, start looking for food. So they're out there and they're feeding heavily on volunteer canola. Those first canola fields that pop out of the ground are going to be a magnet for flea beetles. Um, this may be something to consider when, when wanting to plant canola at this point. Um, given that it'll emerge first, that'll be your prime target for flea beetles. It might be advantageous to wait a little bit, possibly do the soybeans first, then see the canola, and uh, hopefully the flea beetles move on to somewhere else and we don't have to rely as heavily on the seed treatment lasting as long. If we see, we're seeding canola um, April, April 30th, um, seed treatments typically last three to four weeks. Usually the rule of thumb is about 21 days and it depends on, on the level of treatment. Um, but canola that has not emerged by the end of that month is no longer protected. So once that window expires, that's it. And by seeding a little bit later, we're getting those warmer conditions, we're getting that, that um, seed treatment to be a little bit more effective and last a little longer uh, when the flea beetles are in their prime feeding season. So if we have that seed treatment run out before the flea beetle prime seed feeding season hits, um, we can still see a lot more damage. And just a, another look at economic thresholds. So the general guide is 25% uh, leaf defoliation. Uh, leaf that it does look pretty bad when we hit that 25%, but just uh, it's keep in mind that the numbers where we're looking at 20%, 20% here, uh, we're look, getting close to that threshold, but we certainly weren't reaching it. It's only when they begin feeding on the main stem, which is tends to be a habit a little bit more so of striped flea beetles when they're cutting off that main stem at the soil surface or below the soil surface, so that counts 100% loss. And then we do, uh, definitely need to, to look at um, control options. So not just the leaves, but the stems and again, cotyledon feeding up to the four leaf stage. So there's multiple insecticide options that currently exist. Uh, the new NICs are still approved and, and able for use as a seed treatment on canola after the pollinator review. Um, it has taken effect from, from PMRA. They are undergoing further review under the aquatic invertebrate um, section so with, with that uh, lens. And um, the, the regulations may change after that point, but currently they're still allowed as a seed treatment in Western Canada. So planted canola or low seed population. They're more popular with the increase in seed cost. So remember the economic threshold is lower for wheat and insects under a lower overall population. You have less canola plants there to compete and to begin with if you lose any you, your threshold is reached a lot quicker and, and other management considerations need to, to come into effect either additional herbicide for weeds either um, a foliar spray for flea beetles and uh, the potential for reseeding definitely it does exist especially if we get frost or, or wind scour across the surface or hail or any number of conditions so just be, keep in mind that if, if you're going to be going with a planted population or a low seed population, be prepared to accept the risk and possibly have a few sleepless nights because of it. It's, uh, it, it can definitely add to the stress factor. And if, if you're the type of farm that likes to head out to, to the cabin on the weekends, um, maybe now is not a good time if you're considering these low seed populations to begin with. So be extremely cautious in seed row placed fertilizer and know your seed bed utilization. So looking ahead, reevaluate your canola stands after they emerge. Do scout regularly, uh, knowing that reduced stands will impact weed competition, herbicide timing, number of passes, as I mentioned, and scout for early disease. Uh, if we do get some warm, moist weather coming up uh, in areas that uh, have a, a, club root, a high club root risk or, or a known club root uh, infection or, or adjacent to an RM with, with higher club root concentrations, Look for that disease. It can show up as early as the six leaf stage in the, in the rosette. Um, it's not typically found unless it has those ideal conditions, but certainly look for it. Look near your field entrances, your field corners in the low spots, the water runs around um, sloughs. 
and dig up the plants. Don't just pull them out because you risk ripping off the root and not finding anything in there at all. But look for the roots as well. I mean, this goes for farmers across Manitoba and, and the prairies. Um, we do a great job of scouting above ground things, but we don't usually look at what's happening below the ground. So take a little trowel with you and dig up plant roots from time to time just to see what's happening under there. Uh, as far as clubroot, this is part of my clubroot messaging. We do talk about sanitation and biosecurity. So just regulate who enters your fields. Um, that your retailers and, and agronomists have the clubroot farm ma or management plan in place. Um, off farm visitors require booties or they clean their footwear with bleach in and out of the field. Uh, stage field operations to reduce soil transfer. Now, if you have a field that you know have a, has a clubroot problem or, or as a field of concern, say if you're farming uh, a dozen quarters, Farm the 11 quarters that don't have the club root first, and then go on to that, that last field. Seed it last, spray it last, work it last, harvest it last. Um, that way, hopefully, uh, you have time at the end of those operations to stop the machine, knock off as much soil as possible, and potentially disinfect it with the bleach solution, just to make sure we're, we're doing as much as you possibly could to reduce the spread of club root and risk uh, moving it over the entire environment or your whole farm. So in summary, so adjust the seeding rate based on your seed size and your fertilizer placement strategy and get your nitrogen and sulfur fertilizers out of the seed row, particularly in, in years where we have these dry conditions and we don't have enough seed bed moisture. And reduce the seed place phosphorus rate if that continues to be a concern. Uh, don't seed too deep, uh, delay possibly, and wait for rain or royal, warmer soil temperatures to germinate. And that also helps with uh, flea beetle management and scouting for flea beetles and knowing your economic threshold. Print off that image I had earlier, get it on a card, and just use it as a comparison guide when you're out in the field looking for uh, flea beetle damage. Uh, I did talk about a bleach solution. This is a this is the recommended solution to, to reduce and, and kill club root spores. To making a 2%, you need to make a 2% concentrate. So these are the different uh, household bleach brands you could buy in the store. This is just a quick uh, cheat sheet to how to make a how to make a guide, uh, really quick, and, and what um, ratios of bleach and water to add. And that's all I have. Uh, if anybody has any questions on the line, Laurie, I'd, I'd happy to be happy to address them. I actually do have a question, Dane. Sure. Uh, all right. So, have you done any work with some of the newer fertilizer sources like MES15 or MESZ in terms of safe, safe seed placement rates? Some of these products are lower salt index, and getting lots of questions from growers on how far to push those rates. Mm -hmm. I haven't any, done any of that work personally. My my colleague John Hurd uh, is the folks is the guy who who does um, crop fertility and and uh, seed placed uh, fertilizer type of, of extension and research. I'd have to ask him specifically on, on those products. I don't believe, believe he's uh, ever checked them side by side, given that uh, regulations for fertilizer use in Canada don't require to prove efficacy or prove um, benefit in any particular way. So I'm not familiar with this work offhand. I'd have to ask John or have to ask the, the, the Farmer with a question or agronomist with a question to contact John Hurd directly. He would be a better resource than Anap and I would be. Okay, thank you. I have another one here. How corrosive is the bleach solution to equipment? It's it's a little rough on equipment. It's particularly tough on hoses, gaskets, seals, uh, things like that. Um, it does take a little time, obviously, before it starts getting to show uh, corrosion effects. If if someone is going to sanitize their equipment. Um, I like to recommend at least once a week then, if you're going to sanitize at least once a week, just power wash that off. Just use straight water and then wash everything else off as well. Just so you can try and get that the bleach residue gone. Um, it does give your your, soil, your seals and hoses and tires, things like that, a little bit longer life and uh, a little bit less wear and tear. Okay, Lionel, that's all I have at the moment. Okay, and I got one here too. Um, um, what is, uh, you mentioned uh, for your canola plants and your stand, you know, for optimum is, uh, you know, that five to eight, I think is what you said. Uh, the question is, what is the number of plants that would be acceptable? So let's say you're out there scouting and you're getting, I don't know, you're getting, you're not getting five to eight. What would be an acceptable number for, you know, making that decision whether I should be? Sure. 
looking at going back in or or leaving. Mm -hmm. Uh, canola is very flexible and if we have decent conditions, growing season conditions uh, later in May, so say we had a really rough spring like it is now, it's, it's been cold, it's been kind of miserable, uh, canola that's coming out of the ground is getting either fr frosted off or, or um, having to deal with flea beetles. Um, canola is pretty resilient. So, I mean, we, we target five to seven plants, adult plants surviving per square foot. If we hit four, we st generally still um, hit nearly 100% yield potential does drop off slightly. That that wouldn't be a level where I would consider reseeding. It's when we drop around to the one to two plants per square foot range that I start to have concerns. That field needs to be watched very very closely. It'll look ugly as all get out uh, until until the bolting or blooming. But if, if the entire field is consistently one to two plants per square foot, uh, the farmer may be better off leaving that field instead of uh, going to crop insurance having it written off and reseeding, say the third week of May. Um, generally, the yield potential is still there as long as we get good growing season conditions. But if the wet, bad weather persists, we get uh, you know four inches of rain uh, the last week of May, uh, and, it, and a lot of it drowns out and it just doesn't, doesn't do anything and the low spots puddle and they, and they thin and, and it's really patchy, then maybe it, it may be better to, to add something else back in and look at your insurance options or at least consider reseeding those low areas and, and patch managing it as it were and, and dealing with harvest operations, spring operations separately for those areas. Okay, well, those are the ones I had today here. So uh, thanks again, Dane, for, uh, for being on today. And I guess with that, Lori will uh, bring the screen back to me and I will continue on with the webinar. Sounds great, thanks, Lionel. Okay, so uh, we're going to do talk a little bit about uh, start with the crop update here and then uh, go. Uh, I'm actually going to flip through a few slides here and get into the crop update. So, uh, like I mentioned earlier on, this was Sunday, May the 5th, and you can see the tractor and air seeder and the, the image in the background. So. Uh, Definitely been some different growing or seeding conditions this year uh, for producers to go through. But uh, like always, I'd like to put up uh, what uh, what we've been seeing over the past week and uh, and what has kind of happened over the past week. And when you look at our our big thing right now is our minimum soil temp our minimum temperatures, and uh, we've uh, we've been pretty much right throughout southwestern Manitoba. We've been in the negatives uh, every evening, pretty much. And when you look at our average temperature, you know we're anywhere between three and and five degrees Celsius for an average temperature. So, soil temperatures have uh, have responded, I guess, accordingly. Uh, we're looking at a lot of uh, a lot of uh, soil temperatures in that five to six degree range. Uh, I guess another significant thing that we're seeing is the lack of moisture right now. Uh, we are looking at uh, well below our percent of normal rainfall by this time on average. And uh, I think that's uh, got uh, producers a little bit concerned and probably why uh, a lot of the crop, a lot of the cereal crop has been uh, planted and producers are, are looking at going into oilseed crops just for the fact that uh, they want to take advantage of the moisture that's, uh, that is available right now. When you look at uh, what's been happening over the past week, uh, when we see the majority of uh, uh, the producers have been planting mainly wheat and peas over the past uh, past week, uh, I would say about 70% of the wheat has been planted. Talking to producers, we're probably looking at three to three to five days at most, and we would probably have 100% uh, of the wheat planted in the southwest here. And as the weather continues as is, I think that's probably something that we're going to see. Um, peas, I would say the majority are in right now, and uh, we're seeing uh, seeing them uh, in the ground. Barley and oats, uh, about 50% complete. I think a few producers were uh, uh, more comfortable sowing uh, wheat into the cooler conditions than the barley and oats. So I think uh, that's what's ha what's been happening now for the guys that got the, the wheat in. And uh, some producers have started corn. And again, just uh, I think they started corn because they uh, they 
basically are done to cereals and and want to keep seeding and aren't comfortable yet putting in their the canola and soybeans yet. As I mentioned, very little canola has been planted. Some has is in the ground. I actually uh, talked to one producer where uh, he said the seed has actually started to crack open. Uh, again, you know, uh, a lot of the seed has been in the ground for a long period of time already. Uh, I was uh, in some wheat fields that uh, were sown on the 25th of April and still uh, are just rooting nicely and starting to extend upwards. But again, you know, another three to four days before they'll be through. I haven't heard of any soybeans being planted so far. And I guess the big question right now uh, over the past week has been burn off. Uh, you know, should we be, uh, when should we be doing it? Should we be doing it? Some producers are saying there's nothing growing out there. So they're not going to do it. So I thought later on in the, my presentation here, we talk a little bit about the burnoffs in general and what, have been, what I've been seeing. Uh, comparing seeding progress to what we normally are on average, and this is uh, a five-year average. And normally by this time, after the first week of May, we got about 35 to 40 percent of our wheat acres in. So we're well ahead of schedule on planting. Uh, the uh, red spring wheat, uh, barley and oats, I would say we're probably maybe just a little ahead of schedule. Uh, canola, I would say we don't have 10% of the acres in yet. Uh, either that or grain corn, I don't think there's 30% of the grain corn in as well. Uh, but soybeans, again, 1%. So uh, there might be the odd guy that uh, has started, but I would have big concerns about planting soybeans into these cool soil temperatures. Regarding harvest, uh, there's still some harvest being done in the, in the Southwest here. I think uh, guys are getting closer to getting it wrapped up and, uh, and getting some of the crop, uh, the crop planted again for this year. So now looking at the question of uh, spraying or weight. And uh, I think that's uh, a big concern for a lot of producers right now because uh, burn off is a big part of our weed control program. Uh, throughout the growing season. So uh, uh, when you look at uh, the first thing I would want to talk about when I'm talking about spraying is uh, what we've been seeing for temperatures and, and mainly what we've been seeing for evening temperatures. And when you look at cirrus and you look at, uh, you know, if the, you know, basically the sixth and the seventh, we're seeing, you know, evening temperatures uh, down in that minus four, minus two to minus minus two to minus five range for probably a good portion of the evening. So definitely uh, plants are, are feeling some stress uh, in, in that area. You go a little bit farther north towards the Oakburn, Minnegosa type areas, and you're seeing temperatures even dropping down to minus six. Again, you know, getting, uh, getting to the point where uh, a lot of the, uh, even a lot of the winter annuals are shutting down and, uh, and not and not you know uh, not responding well the following day to to any type of temperatures, but then when you get in the southern portion of, of the region, you get the Muscata areas. Uh, you know they're only dipping down to you know minus two to minus three. So again, uh, regarding spraying, I think uh, one of the biggest things we need to be aware of is uh, where you are. And, and how cold it is getting at night. And that's where these weather stations that Timmy had mentioned uh, a couple of webinars ago uh, that are out there, all this information is available on, on our, uh, if you go into Manitoba Ag Weather, it'll bring up all these stations and uh, it's a, a good source for, to, to get the information as to, as to how cold it has been getting in the evenings. So spring and cool weather. Well, we control at cooler temperatures uh, can be uh, compromised by a few things. Once you get those cooler temperatures, uh, the plants aren't growing. If plants aren't growing, they're not going to take up the chemicals, so you get reduced herbicide uptake. You also get poor translocation through the plant. So even though the plants may be taking some of the chemical up, it's not moving very far through the plant. So if you're looking at getting control of uh, uh, quack grass, let's say, or some of the uh, other winter annuals like uh, dandelion, uh, you know, you're not going to get uh, far into those root systems. So you're not going to get 
um, as good a control. And I guess that's what activity at the target site, basically you're just not getting great, uh, great absorption of the chemical and good pickup of the chemical. So your, uh, your weed control is definitely going to be reduced. In cool weather, you know, uh, uh, you know, you can spray glyphosate uh, once the temperatures are five to six degrees Celsius. And, uh, you know, basically, uh, you know, once the temperatures uh, are, you know, eight degrees Celsius for at least two to four hours and no risk of frost overnight. So basically telling you if the temperature, if you're gonna go and spray, uh, you will get some control in these situations, but I think the bigger concern there is the risk of frost overnight. And I don't think we've been able to uh, spray comfortably over the last uh, week without saying that we are not having the potential of frost overnight. And uh, actually last night was probably the first night that we probably hadn't experienced uh, frost in the Southwest here in the last week. The big concern is if temperatures drop below minus five. So again, you know, if you're in areas, uh, Cirrus through to, you know, north and northern areas like uh, Minnedosa, Shoal Lake areas, uh, we've been experiencing the minus five overnight, even closer to the minus six. You can see uh, damage happening because of the frost. And in those situations, um, you know, you're going to have uh, problems with uh, chemical update uptake and uh, uh, you know you're not just going to you're not going to get good control so in a lot of those cases uh, probably best uh, if uh, you wait a couple days for those plants to get growing again and then uh, and then actually spraying them when we're going to experience days like we had yesterday where we had uh, the highs actually getting up into that 13 to 15 degrees celsius range So some tips to help you make your decision uh, whether you should be, uh, I guess the question I've been getting a lot is, you know, I'm not going to spray because there's not enough weeds out there right now. And um, that's, uh, that's a hard call to make because the weeds are actually there. Uh, the weeds are coming and I think you need to determine your weed population first. So go out there and really scout the fields closely. Uh, a lot of times you may not think the weeds are there. Uh, it, it, we're not seeing them five inches tall or, you know, really standing, you know, up on the field right now. You need to get out there and really look because they have germinated. A lot of them are just breaking ground. Some of the winter annuals have, uh, are, are growing. It's just that they're not getting tall. Their, their growth has been slow, but they're still maturing and still throwing out new leaves. So you need to get out there and really scout them. The other thing you need to determine is your crop stage because that's going to tell you uh, how many days you have left to do your burn off. And uh, so, you know, go out there and start digging around, pulling up some of those seeds and seeing where they're at. You know, I've been in fields that have been planted for, you know, a week to 10 days and, and not a lot has happened to some of those seeds. And then I've been in fields where they've been in the ground for, you know, five days and you can already see the, the wheat seeds starting to pop up. So again, soil temperature is gonna be, play a, a role in that. And, and how many days you have to make that decision for spraying. The other thing is spray when the weeds are actively growing. So I mentioned that in the previous slide and also when temperatures are, you know, at least in that 15 degrees Celsius. Now 15 would be the optimum. I know we may not have the option in a lot of cases of, of doing that, but at least if it's, you know, 10 and above, uh, then you know the weeds are gonna be growing and uh, and definitely, uh, you know, give you more of advantage, more of a, an opportunity to get control over those weeds. Use a water volume that is stated. Uh, so make sure you're going at the white, right water volumes. I mentioned that the weeds are up, but they're they're small. Uh, you know, so water bet the your better water volumes are going to give you better coverage, and you're going to be able to make contact with some of those really small weeds. Uh, I'll be showing you some slides here uh, coming up. Some of the other question that uh, we're getting is, you know, adding a surfactant or an adjuvant, if it would be something that would uh, would help or aid, and uh, I would think yes. Uh, anything that you can use to help uh, get the product into the plant is going to be a benefit to you at this time. 
especially if conditions stay the same over the next, uh, say, week, uh, week's time period, because I think within the next week, we're going to be seeing crop coming up. So the, the decision to spray is going to have to be made before it comes up. So I think uh, this might be something to look at if you're, uh, if you're, if you're having to go out and spray and, uh, and, uh, look, and conditions don't get a whole bunch better than they are right now. So look at some of the weeds that we've been seeing over the past week here. And uh, this is a dandelion uh, and uh, it's uh, definitely uh, been, uh, you can see where the, the drill put uh, dirt on it. Again, again uh, harder to see from the row, but as you get walking through the field, you can, uh, you can see that uh, it, is, uh, it is a fairly big uh, plant already. And if something isn't done before the crop emerges and uh, that's why you can see there's a wheat seed that's above ground there, but uh, just uh, by, uh, by leaving this, uh, this plant alone and not doing nothing as a burn off, the potential for it to be uh, a major factor in crop is there. And also the fact controlling it in crop is gonna be very difficult because you give this about three to four days of, uh, of sunlight, uh, of nice warm temperatures, it's going to double in size and it's going to just be flowering already. So, you know, again, not only is it going to be using nutrients, but it's also going to be using moisture that the crop may need this year. So, again, if you've got plants like this, uh, to, uh, don't, write, don't think that you don't need to do a burn off and you can control it in crop because it can be more of an issue later on. Uh, this is uh, Absnith. Again, you know, I, a weed that you don't see in a lot of fields, but again, it uh, was in the same field as the dandelion was in. It can be a problem, uh, but again, it's usually not a problem throughout the whole field. It's usually, uh, usually find it in headlands and, and, and areas like that. But again, uh, a weed that can, uh, can get fairly big. Wild oats, uh, it is coming up. So again, You've got uh, wheat that's probably three to four days from uh, breaking through the ground. Uh, in some cases that was sown early, uh, this stuff is up and growing already. Uh, this patch here, you can even see wild oat seeds on the ground. Uh, this stuff is gonna be fairly big by the time it comes for in-crop spraying. Again, something that would be needed to uh, get some control of before, uh, before the, the, your, your crop comes up. You can see where the, uh, the frost has been hurting it. Uh, but one thing to remember with a lot of the grass crops, uh, the growing point stays below the ground uh, till it's about the three to four leaf stage. So in these cases here, uh, you can see, even see where this one, where it froze, you can see the new growth starting to come up again. So a lot of these might look sickly at times, but they're still there and they're still, uh, still uh, actively growing. Kosha, uh, this is one that uh, I think we need to really keep an eye on. Uh, I've been in fields, uh, especially more fields to the south that uh, it's a little bit warmer and uh, the kosha is definitely uh, there and, and in some cases even a little bit bigger than this already. I think the main point here is that uh, um, if you're in an area where there's been some issues and of uh, of Roundup tolerant uh, or glyphosate tolerant uh, kochia. I think you really need to uh, think of what you're going to be applying to fields like this to help get control of these, these kochia because again uh, these kochia left alone uh, are probably going to be uh, fairly large by comes time to in crop broadly uh, spraying. So uh, again uh, burn off uh, with uh, another product to uh, to beef it up is probably something you should be looking at here. And even with uh, the, the dandelion that I showed previously, uh, you know, something uh, a top up to the to your glyphosate is probably not a bad thing to be looking at, especially if you got weeds that are are that tall already or that big already. Foxtail barley, and this is kind of a, a poor poor picture one. There's uh, definitely lots of it around, and and Tammy uh, a couple of weeks ago had talked about about foxtail barley being an issue in some areas and it's one of the ones that's been growing. Again, something that needs to be taken care of before your crop comes up. As you can see, it gets going fairly early and is, is, uh, is going. And when you got a bunch of weeds uh, coming in the field, 
and they're not very big right now. I think the biggest concern, or one of the concerns we might have this year is, is, is moisture. So let's try to get, a, get them under control. Tammy did take this picture and uh, put it on Twitter and I wanted to use it today, but even uh, uh, east of here, we're seeing some buckwheat starting to come up, you know, again. So you really need to get out into the field to see the, to, the scouting, I guess, is what this tells us is so important because this is about the size of a dime, so you're never, never going to see it driving across the field with, uh, with the truck or even on a quad. You need to actually get out and walk around and take, uh, take a close look at these, uh, these weeds are starting to come. This uh, next few slides, I, I'm just going to show you what uh, we're seeing some of the wheat that we've been digging up and seeing what it's been doing. So this field here was sown on the, uh, uh, I think this one was May the 1st, and you can see that these kernels are just starting to pop up. So there are no uh, real root development yet, but just starting to, to pop up and and uh, they're taking on moisture. So, you know, again, they will, some heat and these things would take off. And I think the big point to take off, uh, take from the next few slides here is even though these seeds and some of them may not be doing anything, if we do get some 15 degree days or, or higher, these plants are going to germinate fast and grow fast. So keeping an eye on your fields is gonna be very crucial, especially if you haven't done any burn up yet. Uh, there's a pea seed that was planted uh, probably right at the end of April. And so just, again, not doing a whole bunch in the ground yet, which kind of surprised me though. The whole field was like this and uh, maybe it was just a little bit drier and, uh, and, and just, uh, you know, maybe, maybe could have been planted a tad deeper just to put it a little bit more into moisture. Garth Johnson, who works for Farmer's Edge, put this, uh, this one up and here's a field closer to Verdon area. And so I mentioned earlier on, you have to look at your location and where you are as to how crop is coming up. Uh, that area is probably, uh, or has been showing a lot warmer uh, evenings compared to the, in the Hamiota areas, the Cirrus areas, the, the Oakburn areas. It's more like the Wascada areas. So the evenings haven't been getting as cold. So a lot of these plants are, are germinating and, and, and coming up. So I guess with that, that's going to uh, uh, end my talk about uh, about um, uh, spraying and what to be looking at right now. And I just want to uh, go back to this slide and just uh, reiterate the one point I made about determining your weed population and determining your crop stage. I think those are the two critical things to take away from this because I think uh, that'll help you make your decision on spraying. The other thing is spraying is definitely a benefit because if the weeds get ahead of your crop, you could be losing yield. So with that, uh, Lori, are there any questions? I do not see any questions. Okay. I always put this one up about the field crop protection guide. Uh, make sure uh, we're getting be we're into spraying season for burn off, and we're going to be not too long into in crop spraying. So these books are available. Uh, our season reports they're up and going. So make sure you check out uh, the uh, government uh, Manitoba government website for all these different uh, reports. Our extension people in Manitoba, don't be afraid to give any one of these people a call if you've got questions in your field. Uh, I'm sure each and every one of them can help you or if they can't, they'll find somebody they can. And join us next week and that shouldn't be May the 8th, it'll be May the 16th. And with that, I'd like to thank everybody for attending. Thanks Lionel.